Hi, and welcome to the HPD Chat. I'm your host, James Hansen. Today, Dr. Harrison is talking uh, with Dr. Patricia Anderson, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Western Illinois, and a pioneer in the field of anthrozoology, the study of interactions between animals and humans. Welcome, Patricia. This should be a really interesting uh, chat today because there's just so much I'm learning about uh, birds every day myself. And so I know the people that will get an opportunity to watch this will enjoy hearing from Patricia. And I think we ought to just jump right into it with uh, the topics that she suggested that we look at. And some of those are ones that she's presented around the world. The AFA convention last year, she was talking about how to increase your uh, relationship with your pet especially Quaker parents, and she's got a real place in her heart for those. So let's just jump into it. Welcome, Patricia, and tell us about uh, your first topic you wanted to talk about, which I think is trick training and why that's important. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, there is a lot of misinformation about training in general. I think it is relates to the idea, the old idea, that it was oppressive or coercive in some way. And uh, what if, if it's done using operant conditioning, positive reinforcement, then it's not at all. It's actually very fun. It's done without any duress. It's, uh, it actually builds a relationship between the, the pet owner and the animal, whether it's a parrot or a dog or, or, or killer whale or whoever. It's just extraordinary how it can change your life and reduce aggression and fear and other behavior problems. And, that's one of the primary reasons that animals end up in shelter and are relinquished is because of behavior problems that could be addressed by using these methods. What were the two terms that you just mentioned right at the top of the, the part when you started? You said um, operant conditioning and or whatever. You used two terms that <laughs> yes, for me I'll... as a veterinarian, I never studied any of that stuff. So as soon as I hear those words, I go, oops, I don't know what that means. <laughs> It's from a, the branch of psychology of behaviorism, behavior science, and it's basically opening up a conversation with a learner, with, and this could be a human or a non-human. And what we're doing is reinforcing any uh, approximation towards a behavior that we would like to see reinforced or increased. So you said approximation. What, what is it you mean by approximation? An approximation would be like taking a step. For example, if you're trying to teach a child how to tie their shoelaces, you could think about how would you do that? You would have to break it down into a number of steps to make it intelligible to them. So we do the same thing when we're training or teaching animals new behaviors. So with trick training, um, there's this idea that perhaps, as I mentioned, it may be coercive, but in fact, it can be very fun for the animals. These are short interactions where you're working with your animal for maybe two to three minutes. And it's something that you can do several times a day. And it really helps to uh, create that bond, a much stronger, more positive bond in the animal. And some of the things that I've taught my birds to do include um, stepping, you know, veterinary behaviors such as uh, or taking um, medicine voluntarily from a syringe or stepping onto a scale to take their weight, which is a good thing to do uh, daily or at least weekly to make certain that they're healthy. And um, there's so many other things that we can teach. One of my parrots has even learned how to paint pictures, and uh, she was some, a bird who came to me from a rescue with a lot of behavioral issues, and she was, by behavioral issues, she would fly to my shoulder and bite until blood ran down my shoulders. And a lot of people would have said, well, you need to cut that bird's wings, trim their wings, and I didn't want to do that because I knew she was frightened. So I said, how can I work with her? So I began to study her and began to, to teach her how to do various things. And this opened up a window into her mind that allowed us to develop a conversation that led to trust. And 
it took me several years for her to trust me enough to actually touch her head. And, several um, years. Pardon? Several years. Several years, yes. And this is very unusual because for more, most birds, you know, I, I ha don't have that problem. She, uh, her name is Ozzy. She was a special case. And I don't know what had happened to her in all of the different foster homes she had allegedly been in before she came to me uh, through the rescue. But she was very aggressive and a very fear aggressive. I think she had been really badly frightened perhaps by somebody who looks like me. And then that's a memory that sticks with the animal, unfortunately. So, and I have to admit, I got Ozzy just at the first, um, during the first time when I first began to study applied behavior analysis, which is this branch, branch of psychology that uh, we derive these important concepts and methods from. So I learned with her and she learned with me. So, and today we have a great relationship. She allows me to, to touch her head and, and pet her and to preen her pin feathers, whereas before she would not. Can so. you give us some examples of what you taught her? Certainly, she does so many different things. She can circle, she can uh, do a foot target, she can target her foot to an abrasive block to trim her nails. She can, uh, as I mentioned, she paints. She also will back up on cue. She, uh, let's see, she stacks objects, stacks with, works with puzzle toys. She has three different puzzle toys that she works with. Stacking cups, uh, stacking um, rings, and also, um, oh, what is the third one? It's a, it's a more complex puzzle that's made of geometric shapes where you have to fit the uh, appropriate object into the appropriate hole, you know, match the colors and shapes. And she does, she's mastered all of those. And I've also been working with her in color discrimination. If I put down an array of objects on her training table, and if I ask her to find blue, for example, then she can go right to that and find the blue and bring me the blue objects. So it's just really, I, I knew I was really making grounds with her one day. She was so intent in what she was doing that she actually fell off the training table into my hands. And we both looked at each other. It's like in the, pa in the past, she would have bitten me, but she didn't at all. She just was completely calm. And she's like, okay, let's get back to it. <laughs> She was so excited that she was actually spitting out the food reinforcers that I was giving her while we were training. Hmm. And um, that was an emotional moment for me because this is a bird who had been misunderstood, I think. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm really happy that she ended up with me. Right. Because if she did up with someone else, it might have been a different story. Well, I'm sure. Well, the next thing you wanted to talk about was, tr was the trust issues was being touched. What, what does touch have to do with birds and behavior? Well, touch, as you know, um, we're primates, right? So we like to touch. We like to hug, even though we're dealing with a pandemic currently. And we're, we're restricted to touching our conspecifics. But in the parrot world, touch is something... Once a parrot reaches maturity, it's something that um, typically is done between mates, between mated birds, and it's not something that we want to, um, we need to be careful with, with our pets, because if we touch them in inappropriate locations near their uh, reproductive organs, then we can actually give them the wrong impression and encourage um, frustration and aggressive behaviors accidentally. So we'd like to restrict our touch to the head, perhaps. But more importantly, we shouldn't expect to ever touch any animal without asking. So I think one of the important behaviors I teach all of my birds is a cue that I ask. I, it's a request. I don't expect they'll ever be able to touch them automatically. And I use, you, know, you could use anything. It's like you could use a word or a gesture. I go like this with my finger. And then usually if they say yes, they'll lower their heads and you know, they'll lean towards me and their body language indicates that yes, this is a good thing. And so we can have this nice tactile interaction, which is very reinforcing for both of us. And you can do all these things with birds that are flighted. That's interesting. 
Do yes, the, um, I don't trim any of my birds. They can fly throughout the house. Throughout the house. Wow. Well, when I allow them out, but I have two groups of parrots. I have pionis, which are larger birds, and I have Quakers, and the pionis are uh, rather aggressive towards the Quakers, so I, can, I have to rotate them. So hmm. keep, them, keep everybody safe. Well, one of the other issues you wanted to talk about was the uh, Quaker parrots and how they're viewed as either naturalized or invasive. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about that? This is a research interest of mine that's very hard for me to write about and talk about because of what has been going on with the depopulation of parrots in Spain. Uh, I think it's in my research, it's, we can, it, it's so frustrating because according to orth ornithological research that has been done, I think the best, most reliable study so far that's been done is one that was done in the Chicago area by Stephen, Dr. Stephen Pruitt Jones and colleagues. 40 year study and they found that the parrots have neutral impact on the environment. So they are not competing with natural species because they build their own nests. And in fact, you know, they're eating vegetation that is introduced. It's not vegetation that would favor or be needed by native species. They don't compete with native woodpeckers or bluebirds who are also who are cavity dwellers because they built their own large twig condos. But that's where they can run into problems with people because they're very highly visible and they can become very large and they might interfere with electrical utilities. And this is where people get concerned and start to think that they perhaps should remove the nests or even eliminate the birds altogether, which is unfortunate. There are, there are certain research that's been done by ornithologists, such as Kevin Bergio, who uh, he and his colleagues developed a technique that is, I think it's uh, trademarked, or not trademarked or copyrighted. It's a, it's a technique that they've used to uh, deter Quakers from building nests on electrical utilities. So that's exciting. So basically in the research, they found that if they can deter the birds from landing on the lines next to the facility, then they, they don't build. So, and some uh, bird advocate groups have built um, alternate facilities for the Quakers to nest on. Too. So there's been some success with that, I think, in Florida and in Texas. So. Don't you think that, the, that they're filling a niche that we've developed by the way we manipulated our environment? I know here in Florida, they're always trying to get rid of one invasive species after another. But I see that they're filling places where other animals have been shoved out of, and they've learned how to live in those environments. And like you're saying, they're actually contributing to uh, yeah. the environment. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. Ornithologists who study their nests in South America where they're native and in other places find that they actually share their nests with many other species, native species. So they do provide a benefit in that way. And um, it's, it's just, it's really too bad. And we do know it relates, it's a result of the so many different native species have been observed using these nests. So it's not, um, so in that sense, they do, they provide, I guess you could say a service or benefit for native wildlife. So, and I think they're spectacular birds. And my first parrot was a Quaker and I got him as an adult when I was working on my dissertation at the University of Chicago. And he was a pre-owned Quaker who came with a lot of attitude, a lot of baggage, a lot of moxie, but he sat beside me and kept me company while I was writing my doctoral dissertation. And uh, it's tough work doing, doing that. And uh, he helped me get through it. But, and I considered him my good luck charm because of the colony in Hyde Park at the University of Chicago 
that's that was my first introduction to the birds. Mm -hmm. But when I did my field research in Mexico, I was entranced by the parrots flying over the uh, the forest, the dry tropical forest in Yucatan, where I was working on the ruins, the Maya ruins in Chichen Itza. So um, <laughs> I was absolutely fascinated. Well, the other thing that's interesting that that I uh, have been following is the Quaker parrot has now become the the model for atherosclerosis. And I know that uh, Dr. Befri is using Quaker parrots, and I think Tom Tully, Don Brightsmith has been studying them in the wild. And um, there's a lot of uh, information or a, a excitement in veterinary medicine about diagnosing atherosclerosis in birds and trying to prevent it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing multiple species that are coming in earlier and earlier with atherosclerosis, especially if they're under high stress situations with a lot of uh, lack of training. If they're prisoned in their cages and don't get out, I think that contributes to it. A lack mm -hmm. of exercise and then of course diet. And we can't identify exactly what's the best diet to prevent it. So it'd be interesting to see if those birds in the wild develop it naturally on their natural diets. I would guess they don't, but how can we duplicate that in, in captivity? Mm -hmm. And the best we know so far is that when the birds are molting, they need a little higher fat and protein. The rest of the year, they need less fat and protein to, to uh, maybe help avoid issues of atherosclerosis because they don't have to become obese to get that disease. They just have to have lack of exercise and then a lack of inflammation, which comes from stress, as I'm sure you're aware. Yeah, unfortunately, I lost one of my most beloved Quakers to that last year. How old was he? 19. Hmm. 19 and he was my best flyer. Really? So we f I flew him every day, yeah. Inside the house, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, he'll, he'll be in the videos. We'll get to see him. His name was Beaker. Huh. He could play basketball too. Oh, he just, he was just a sharp bird and he had, uh, Splay leg. Hmm. I'll be darned. The other thing that a lot of people have a problem with Quakers is they're very loud and screaming. Are you able to control that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I learned is, you know, what do you want your bird to do instead? So you find an incompatible behavior, an alternative behavior that is more ac acceptable such as ringing a bell. So I've taught all my Quakers to ring bells. And so when they want to reach out to me, you know, for a contact call, then they ring the bell. And I can, from the distance, I can reinforce them verbally and tell them, good job, and uh, then go in and give them a reinforcer. But yeah, I, I, we can see that in one of my videos as well. Excellent. I would like to say that it's really, does not take long to work with your parrots. Uh, I, I was asked to write an article for, to, for the magazine Bird Talk on training parrots. And I call it the five minute bird trainer because you really, it really does not take long to work with your bird, just two to three minutes and not even five minutes. And this is something any of us could do, right? And even at any time that you're interacting with your bird that they can see you, then they're really learning about you. You are, in effect, training them. So it's important to learn how to do it properly, appropriately, so we're not reinforcing um, behaviors that we would not like to see that could lead to the bird losing their home. So um, just you know, trick training and um, using positive reinforcement are, is so important. and. Uh, the way that we teach a new behavior is through a process called shaping. And I have some pictures of that and um, I can sh share with you if you would like. That. Oh, that'd be great. As, so, you, as you know, we did an interview with Hilda Neiman and uh, her, her, her uh, premise is the same as yours, using reprimand and not realizing how you communicate with a bird is what's causing the problem. The bird's not creating the problem, it's you that's creating the problem. And it's nice to see a, 
a two minute a day. I would think anybody that has a bird has two minutes a day. Yeah, and just when you go to change their food or water, that is a great time to work with them. You know, if that's all the time you have, that's great. Um, I have a game I play with one of my Quakers, with Ozzy, in fact, that I call it down. And basically, I point down, and she climbs, and she kind of repels down the side of her cage, goes all the way down to the cage floor, and then she climbs all, up, all the way back up as fast as she can. And then she's so excited, and I, so I can reinforce her, and I say, good girl. And she just loves it. And <laughs> it's, it's one of her favorite things to do. And... I just, you know, I'm, I'm silly and excited and she has fun and I have fun too. Because sometimes I work at home very often teaching courses as a university professor. So it, it's just, it's a nice break. I get up and talk to my birds and I can work with them a little bit and reinforce them. And anytime they're earning reinforcement, that is a, a great, great outcome for them. But they're just, it just opens up whole new worlds creating this trust between us and them. So simply changing the environment can make the outcome so much more successful for your animals. So what, what do you mean by that changing the environment? Well, for example, um, if you have a bird that bites, right, you, <laughs> what do you want to do to get them out of the cage? What do most people do? With, with a biting bird or a bird, if they don't know better, they might put their hand into the cage and the bird bites them. And then so then you remove the hand. Why is a bird biting? We don't know for certain, but I could guess probably that the bird may be overwhelmed, may be frightened, but the bird is not certainly out to carry out revenge against us. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about behavior science. It's taught me to be more thoughtful and more observant and more compassionate towards others and not just my birds but also my the humans around me as well to make me think about um what what caused that behavior so how can we make the outcome more successful for them uh, so instead what i would do is put a perch on my cage door and i can show this in video and as you will notice in all my videos with my birds, I open up the cage door, there's a perch on that door, and they, that's their training perch. They automatically go to that perch as soon as they see me because they've received ample reinforcement for going there. So I open up the door and they're already out of the cage. And so that's empowering to them. So I don't have to force them to come out. They can come out, make the decision on their own. And that is really an exciting outcome. I have a great video of uh, my female Maximilian Pionis, Max. And I open up her cage door and I either point to a perch or I hold out my hand and she flies to me from the cage. And I thought that is an empowered bird, right? You see, I don't know, there's no force involved. She makes a decision to come out on her own. And that's what I like to do with my, my birds is I believe in more of a hands-off policy where I'm setting up the environment for them to do things like uh, climb, you know, go from their training perch to the top of a training table to engage with me in various behaviors, but I don't have to constantly touch them. I mean, these, these are birds. I mean, I shouldn't, we shouldn't be constantly touching them because as we mentioned before, this can lead to inappropriate messages, inappropriate behaviors that can cause uh, aggression, other behavioral problems. So um, hands off, I think is really powerful and shows that you have yet a great conversation, uh, relationship with your animal. Yet as primates, and this goes back to this idea of touch, we tend to want to touch our animals, but again, it should, there should be a sense of informed, of con, or I would say informed, but a sense of consent Right? We should ask our animals instead of just automatically assuming we can touch them. So That's great. We just did an interview with Dr. Todd Driggers, and that was one of his final messages to us. He said he went into his uh, kid's room and showed him how he's decorated his kid's room for them, et cetera, et cetera. Then he put the, one of the children in a cage, and he shut the door and threw a couple toys in there and said, you know, they don't have any ability to make choices anymore but they're safe, right? They're safe from cats, they're safe from dogs, or don't chew electrical wires. 
this is what we're doing to birds. We've taken away their ability mm -hmm. to make a choice. And you're Absolutely. saying just a simple choice of whether they come out or not is their mm -hmm. choice, not your choice. That, that's really revolutionary thinking in my mind. Yeah. And the same way going back into the cage too, this is where so many people have problems because it's very reinforcing to be outside of the cage. So what do you do is you provide reinforcement inside the cage, very high value reinforcement that they wouldn't typically get outside the cage. And I, I have absolutely no problems. I, it's been many months, years since I've been bitten. And sometimes I'll get a little pinch from a bird if I know I've gone too far but they don't bite me. They don't break the skin anymore. They just give me a little pinch to let me know, okay, you've gone too far, back off, okay? So, and that's really important information and I appreciate it because I know the difference. So I, I reinforce them for that and I say, thank you. And can, can I tell you something, one of the most powerful things I learned in animal behavior and training was when I was at the Shed Aquarium taking a course with the great Ken Ramirez and he was talking about the whales there, the beluga whales. And he said, the senior female whale, there were certain behaviors she, she's just refused to do. And so the trainers were perplexed because they didn't know why she was refusing. So they thought of the idea to teach her to let them know that she wanted to say no. So they reinforced her for touching a red float. So that was her no button, right? So anytime she didn't want to do something, she would just swim over to that no button, to that red float, and touch it. And they would reinforce her, and they'd say, thank you for that information. And then they would ask her to do another behavior, and she would. So it was all about choice. It's like, she just didn't want to do it at that time. But then they would ask her a little bit later, and, and she could. And another exciting thing I found out was that the doors to their enclosures are always open during the performances they can always choose to leave if they wanted to hmm. so it's it's all about empowering giving animals space and because when we put them into two small spaces then we're going to see behavioral problems and i think as you mentioned if you take one behavior away like we need to replace it with something else we need to give something back to them and control is one of those primary reinforcers that's so important. So uh, a learner who doesn't feel like they have any control over the outcome over their life is miserable. Mm. So that's give great. that back to them. That's great information. One of the problems I had when I first started asking people to write for different articles and books was I saw training uh, by some, some of the trainers. They were basically forcing the birds by hunger and by deprivation to do tricks, and, and to me that was called bribery. That wasn't wasn't giving them a choice. It was saying you need this, so you better do that. And right. you 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 and several other of your colleagues are, are changing that. That's great. But it could be it certainly could be manipulated and be um, uh, abused. But what we want to do is give them choice. When we're giving food, it has it, it's a payment. It's reinforcement. It's part of a reciprocal arrangement, right? So you do something for me, I do something for you. It's like it's something is understood. And this is the basis of our social contract. You know, we, we engage in this every day. <laughs> you go to work, you get paid. And right. I've had students say, well, I don't think we should have to reinforce our animals. They should just do it before us because they love us. I was like, well, how about if I trained you to be my personal assistant in, would you expect a salary if I asked you to continue working for me after I trained you? Well, yes. And I said, well, well, no, shouldn't you just love me so much and respect me so much that you'd want to do it for free? Well, no. And I was like, well, the same for our animals. What's in it for them, right? We have yeah. to make it worth their while. I've been carrying on a conversation with a lady to, to um, help her try and get involved with some behaviors to get her birds to stop biting her. And one of the things that it, it's been really hard to get across is how do you make that reinforcer valuable? Because in the morning when she gets up, she makes about two gallons of fruits and vegetables that are gonna be 
used for those birds to go, and she just puts a big piece of plastic on the floor, and the birds can spend an hour down there eating pineapple and grapes and cherries and whatever they want, and then she doesn't understand, well, they don't want to work for me, and then they bite me, and it's because they've already got whatever they wanted in the morning. Why would they work for a tiny piece of cherry in the afternoon? Right, so the best time to train is in the morning, right before you give them all the, the gallons of food or whatever. And it also, um, it's important to study them and find out what foods are most reinforcing and reserve those for training. What ones do you like? Do you let the birds make that choice too? Oh, absolutely. Reinforcers are always determined by the learner, not by us. So Great. yeah, my, my birds love to work for pieces of walnut, walnut or especially walnut, walnut's the highest value in reinforcer, but they also like to work for pieces of almond. Your, your reward has to maintain its value. And if you use a whole almond, then they're not gonna work for an eighth of an almond, right? Right, so what I do, yeah, I cut my almonds up to like eight or more pieces. So they're really small fragments. And you want it to be just enough for them to eat very quickly. You know, and um, Quakers, for example, you really don't want it to be big enough for them to hold it in their foot. You want them to just immediately put it in their mouths and, and then it's gone. You're not starving your birds because they're right. still getting their regular food. But I don't know, my birds really love their Harrison's pellets. <laughs> I put the, I put the um, the Quakers. In, they have foraging balls, and I put the. They like the coarse, the large coarse ground pellets because they can pick them up in their feet and eat them. I put them in their uh, foraging balls, and then they roll them around the floor of the cage. You know, knock the heck out of them, so they can get the. But that's the first thing they'll go to. They'll if I give them food, uh, veggies, or the, in the Harrisons, they go right to the Harrisons first. How do you think the captive parrot situation is contributing to either gene pools or this issue of too many unwanted birds? That is something that I have not studied intensively. I know it seems to be a problem. There are birds ending up in rescues. And one of the problems is that we don't have an overall agency in this country to track how many rescues we have regarding parrots. So we don't actually know how many birds are out there in rescues. So I would like to see the data before I could make any conclusions. But certainly, anytime a bird loses its home and ends up, has to be relinquished, this is a sad thing. It's, it's a problem. And, uh, and the reason a bird may lose its home may be due to behavioral, but it all could be also be a, a function of an owner becoming ill and, and dying. And right now I'm really worried about the situation with COVID-19. Uh, what is going to happen to the parrots that belong to people who become infected and perhaps pass on? That is a major problem. Anthrozoology is a relatively new interdisciplinary um, approach that was developed uh, about 40 years ago in England. And it is a study of human animal interactions, interdisciplinary, meaning that we have veterinarians, zoologists, historians, sociologists, anthropologists, and um, nurses, and people from many different fields who've come together to try to understand how our relationships with the natural world and the animals that live in it are shaped by our various disciplines and approaches. And my approach, uh, I developed my anthrozoology course at Western Illinois University many years ago. Uh, probably, I've been teaching it since 2000. And in my approach, I'm interested in how culture affects the way that we view the natural world. You know, and so it makes a big difference if we view the natural world as a resource to be exploited, then we're not so, it's a very anthropocentric perspective. We're not so um, concerned about its inhabitants, right? So I try to get, turn the course, people's viewpoints on, on their heads, turn it upside down and try to get them to think from the animal's 
animals perspective and try to, to understand how we impact the natural world and how these attitudes can and should be changed. So in a prime example now I can talk about, of course, is the COVID-19. Where did it come from? And <laughs> we can kick all the conspiracy theories to the curb, I hope. But we know, understand scientifically from all of the reports I've heard so far that it comes as a result of environmental destruction in China, where there's been spillover events, right, where we have zoonotic diseases that are jumping species boundaries from animal to human. And when we go into an environment and cause so much destruction to the natural world, we're putting these animals under so much stress, and then they're likely to develop illnesses. And so this uh, just makes the situation ripe for a type of event such as we're experiencing now, unfortunately. So we need to be really more careful citizens of the world. Well, thank you for sharing your compassion and your uh, brilliant observation of obviously your work studying ancient relationships between people, then people with animals, and now people with birds. And, and we certainly need more of what you have to offer, and we look forward to doing that in the future. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the HBD Chat, a production of HBD International, Inc., Harrison's Bird Foods, and Wild Wings Organic Wild Bird Foods. We're always looking for interesting guests and new topics to discuss. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts about this podcast. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel.